Hi everybody, it is so wonderful to see you all. I am going to quickly invite um, a wonderful Anna who is uh, joining me for this Insta Live today. So just give me a second. I am so excited <laughs> to see you today. I'm so glad that people are watching us and I am inviting and yes, she has joined us. We are waiting for her to um, join and in just a second when she goes live, there she is. Hi, Anna. Привет, hi. Hi, привет. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see you. How are you doing today? You too. Yeah, really good, thanks. Uh, it's freezing today in Moscow. It's minus 20. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember those days? <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, I haven't seen snow since 2017. Uh, well, in California, I saw snow once uh, when I went to Lake mm -hmm. Tahoe, but um, I, I uh, kind of forgot what it feels like to be cold, to be honest. <laughs> I forgot what it feels what? like to have your ears freezing, you know, in the cold. So, is it really? Is yeah. it snowing? Is it snowing bad? In yeah, it's really, Africa? really, it's really snowy, and it, it's beautiful. It's really nice, but it's it's so cold today. I I just you know I took the bus from my grandmother's place, and uh, whew, yeah, I got home freezing. Um, I've forgotten the feeling as well, actually, because last winter was really warm. It was like around zero no snow it was actually not great so this year is like real russian winter but uh you need to dress for it yes i was going to ask you uh you know from one russian to another what is your what is your life hack how do you deal with extreme cold because in russia mm. you know unlike the us nothing closes down when it's really cold or nothing closes down in case of a snowstorm we just like keep on with our lives so what do you do no i know we like to laugh at everyone who closes things down like <laughs> oh, oh, oh. it was just minus 20 and they had to close everything um well um tomorrow morning is supposed to be minus 24 and i'm very glad my husband is walking kit our son to kindy preschool because um i wouldn't be happy doing that to be honest i haven't felt this bad um i don't know this year it hasn't been so bad. Maybe after four years in warm Georgia, you know the the country you've you've been there. I know um, mm -hmm. four years of really warm weather. I mean, not really warm, but warmer weather. It hasn't been so bad. I don't know. I I've missed the snow, so I'm enjoying it um, a fresh sort of. You know, I'm looking at it uh, as a non kind of like a non-Russian going. Oh wow, this is so pretty. You no, know, I'm taking <laughs> pictures and stuff. Um, and just dressing for it, you know, and as long as you're moving, it's okay. Like yeah. I would have been fine if I hadn't had to wait for that bus today. I would have been okay. If you just, you just have to dress for it and uh, it's fine. And it's still, you know, there's no wind today. Hasn't been windy. So as long as it's not windy, it's totally fine. But in St. Petersburg, I believe it's always windy, isn't it? Uh, so the weather in St. Petersburg in the winter is notoriously bad. Um, at least, you know, comparing with other places in the country, yes, it can be extremely cold, um, but then you at least get to enjoy the snow. And there are some of those like yeah. really sunny days when it's the snow, snowy and sunny, frosty, beautiful. In St. Petersburg, um, it's believed that we only have about between 30 and 60 days of sunshine per year. Uh, which is uh, crazy uh, yeah and so most yeah. of our winters not only are they dark because we're really far north so the sun comes out at like 11 a.m goes down at 5 p.m uh but yeah it's really mm -hmm. wet because we're really close to the sea and um mm -hmm. it's you know oftentimes we don't really have like proper snow it melts pretty much the moment it falls on the ground the uh, puddles yeah. everywhere and do you know that feeling when the puddle is covered with like a thin layer of ice? You don't know oh, yeah. whether it's like a proper icy yeah. ground or like whether your foot is going to fall. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. 
Well, everybody, uh, I see, you know, some people have joined us already. And uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us and introduce Anna to you. Uh, she is a remarkable speaker. Anna is a good friend of mine. Um, she was actually uh, one of the witnesses at our wedding. <laughs> which is, yes, so, yes. And I was looking through the photos, you know, as I was writing the piece on you, going, oh, that was so nice. Yeah, yeah. So that was really cool. We know each other for a long time. And um, there are so many remarkable things about Anna that my followers always ask me some questions, which... Yes, I can answer them, but I feel like Anna is such an expert in all of the so many things that people really care about. First of all, Anna is a writer, and she writes a lot about food. She is the author of the Soviet Diet Cookbook, which I just, yeah, feel free to grab it and um, show it to us, uh, because this is such an amazing <laughs> concept. Uh, it's not just a cookbook with recipes, it also... Um, through this book, Anna also shares stories of her family because I, I, for me too, Soviet food is so simple, right? In a lot of ways, um, you have to be really inventive to cook Soviet food, right? Because there were often like shortages <laughs> of different ingredients and you had to be, yeah. you know, ready to replace one thing with another. And so it always comes with some remarkable stories, which is great. And then, um, so she shares those stories with us. Oops, <laughs> um, my light was, went off, but that's all right. Um, and then another amazing thing about Anna, um, she's currently living in Moscow. Um, you grew up in Moscow, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. but for a while, yeah, Anna also lived in Tbilisi, Georgia, which is just such a wonderful place that so many people want to visit. I know that it's on so many people's bucket lists. Um, yeah. And we also got to visit Anna um, and her husband <laughs> in Belize. Yeah, was that was so nice. Yeah, that was lovely. Probably five years ago now. Yeah, yeah, it was. So, Anna, can you tell us first a little bit about your amazing cookbook? Just how did you even come to write it? What? Uh, what? How did you get the idea? Uh, well, I love that story because I didn't have the idea. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm someone who always has ideas for different things and uh, annoys my husband endlessly. Uh, but uh, this time it actually wasn't my idea. And I love that because um, I was running my uh, cooking classes for children in Moscow, which I did for a number of years. That was really fun. And uh, through those classes, I met this American lady who was an <laughs> editor. And uh, she approached me to write uh, a piece for Russia Beyond the Headlines. Um, she wanted a, a recipe and a story about vareniki and um, pirashki. Mm -hmm. um, should I explain what, yes, what those are? Okay, so vareniki um, is what you, in America you call them pirogi, because the, I think you use the Polish word. Mm -hmm. So the um, dumplings uh, basically filled with um, cottage cheese or... Uh, fruit or berries they're really delicious and the uh, pirashki are those small filled pies you know my grandmother makes them with cabbage or you can make them with rice and and spring onion with egg with meat all sorts of different things and so when i was approached by this editor um to write these pieces i went well you know my grandmother has the recipes of course but like i've never written anything i'm not a writer so don't expect much and she was just like you know what just write whatever you feel like writing, no pressure. And I went, okay, you know, and I, and so I did and I enjoyed it and uh, they were popular on the website. And then she said, well, why don't we run this project for a year where you will be cooking through the book of tasty and healthy food. Kniga uh, you know, this iconic Soviet cook, which I'll actually, I'll show you as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah, sure. Why not? Sounds like fun. You know, she wanted to see, how it has sort of stood the test of time, whether, you know, more than day Russian girl would actually have fun cooking from that <laughs> book. And the only thing that was my idea was bringing my grandmother along because I felt like if it was just me trying out old recipes, I would run out of steam quite quickly. It would sort of get old, you know, with the, you know, the equipment, the, the ingredients, um, it would get old. So I said, no, how about we, 
get my grandmother along and I'll ask her questions about how things used to be. She's got all these stories. And uh, they went, yeah, sure, that's a great idea. So uh, that's how it started. And it ended up running for two years instead of one. And, um, you know, eventually my grandmother put a stop to it because she said, okay, I've exhausted all of my <laughs> stories. Like, it's enough. <laughs> which amazing. actually, which wasn't true because she's still telling me stories that I haven't heard. Like last night, inspired actually by you. Thank you very much. Um, no, when I interviewed you and you, you told me about your communal apartment, Comunalka living experience. And then you mm -hmm. told me about this course on Comunalki, on Narzamas, and I listened to it and I found it so interesting that last night she was just out of hospital and uh, we were talking about things and I said, oh, you know, I just listened to this amazing course. It was so much fun. And I told her about it and um, I told her about how people would write danos, you know, like letters on each other, uh, complaining about each other, trying to get rid of people in the apartment to get the room. And she said that uh, there was a guy who used to write these letters about my great grandmother complaining about the fact that she had family overseas and how she was keeping in touch with them, trying to get her a room. And um, she got called to the KGB uh, for a conversation. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I've never heard that story before. And uh, well, it turned out she went and, you know, my great grandmother, she would just tell it as it is. She just went and said, yep, I have family overseas. I keep in touch with them. Um, that's it. That's the whole story. And the guy who wrote this letter, well, he's not a very nice person, but you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much just, I, I want to explain a little bit, uh, cause if I heard mm -hmm. this for the first time and I was like, well, okay, so you complain about someone and then you end up getting their room. Like what yes, are some, absolutely. Um, it needs explaining. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Like what are, what are the steps in between? Right. So, um, Soviet, you know, the Soviet times are notorious, you know, for, get, you know, people being arrested by the KGB, right? And another thing yeah. is that in the Soviet time, people lived in these communal apartments um, where each family would occupy normally one room and then they would share communal spaces, um, like the kitchen and the bathroom. And I hope, you know, since we are talking about growing up in Russia in the 90s, I lived in such an apartment as a kid and I will share a bit about those too. Um, but ultimately, so some of them don't even have like a place to wash yourself, no, no shower or no bathtub. Anyway, you can imagine how miserable it is to live like this when like you just have one room for your fa whole family. And so what people would do, they would basically quote, like to use for the lack of a better word, snitch on each other to the KGB yeah. and <laughs> have their neighbors exactly. arrested. So then they could occupy their rooms. <laughs> um, so basically, basically that's what would happen. And um, um, yeah. That's, yeah, so that happens. Thank you yeah, for that background. Yeah, it was definitely necessary. Uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's what happened to my uh, great grandmother. Well, I mean, luckily she was okay. Like, you know, they stayed in the room, didn't get arrested. Um, and uh, my grandmother lived in a communal apartment for 30 years. So born in one, and she was 30 when she moved out into a Khrushchevka, uh, one of those uh, Khrushchev time buildings, uh, five stories, no lift. Do you have many of those in St. Petersburg? Yes. I, if I'm not mistaken, if, uh, if a building has, well, first of all, um, a lot of these communal apartments, oh, you mean Khrushchevki? Yes. Yeah. We do have a lot of those. And basically, um, if a building has five or less floors, you don't have to put an elevator in. And so, yeah, mm. um, uh, they normally don't have an elevator. And this is the kind of apartment I kind of graduated into after I got married so, or kind of like around, around, around the time that okay. I got married. So you never got to live in a communal ap apartment, right? You no. grew up in a proper no. <laughs> separate apartment, right? I, I did, yeah, and it was a funny story as well. You know how people used to buy apartments. It was really difficult. It was like this whole experience. So my, so my great grandmother and my grandmother and my grandfather moved into uh, Khrushchevka, an apartment of their own on the fifth floor, no elevator, like you said, um, mm -hmm. which my grandmother got to experience last night. You know, with her newly broken hip, uh, climbing up the five stairs, but she did it. And uh, yeah, 
that's amazing. Um, they moved into one of those in 1962. So uh, when they were pretty new still, these brand new buildings. My mom was born in one. And, uh, and then when I was, I think just before I was born actually, my, my parents and my grandma managed to buy an apartment in this whole new neighborhood a uh, brand new uh, built neighborhood where they took Margaret Thatcher to even to show off this uh, new uh, Soviet style, you know, late eighties um, uh, um, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. which had, uh, you know, there was, there was uh, nothing pretty much here. You know, there was no, no pavements and no lights. It was just dirt roads. Like you had to wear, like huge Wellington's, what do you call them? Gumboot. Mm -hmm. uh, Gumboot yeah. to Rainboot, get into the center. I'd say, yeah. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like mom said, you would be able to tell those people from the new neighborhoods in the center, you know, covered in dirt. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> it took ages to get into town. And uh, they queued for something like um, five years to be able to buy, to be able to buy, um, to pay, like no market rent market price for uh, an apartment it was a lot of money you know uh and uh, basically my whole family chipped in you know everybody used up all of their savings uh mid 80s you know everything they had and they put it into this apartment and uh was a flip of a coin uh what floor the apartment was going to be on um, you know, uh, wh which building it was going to be in. They couldn't choose anything. It wasn't mm -hmm. like you're paying money and you get to choose your apartment. You know, oh, I want the fifth floor <laughs> and I want it to, you know, to overlook the park or this or that. You know, you just, uh, they were lucky to get the eighth floor because, you know, the, as you know, the ground floor and the top floor are not desirable. And they managed to get the eighth floor and that's where I grew up. And I'm still in this neighborhood, actually. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more why the ground floor and the top floor are not desirable? Yes. Well, especially because I, I lived on the ground floor. I know about the ground later. floor. Yeah. I lived on one for um, seven years or something uh, in the same neighborhood in a different apartment. And, well, basically, everyone walks past you. You know, um, these uh, apartment blocks are just so densely populated. So you've got a ton of people walking past your past your window all the time and you need to like close up the curtains all the time or you need to have bars on the window so nobody can get in and once uh we were hosting a party in um 2005 or something and uh there's lots of people in the apartment and uh, yet somebody managed to get inside our apartment and steal some stuff and oh. leave the apartment and there was like at least 20 people there, you know, it was like student years, lots of people partying and, um, but it's a ground floor living, you know, anyone can do it, just get in and out. And uh, luckily it was just empty handbags of mine, which Aww. I had a few. <laughs> just... Okay, so our theories are the same. Uh, you, yeah, you don't want the first or the ground floor because um, your apartment is really easy to break into. And I don't know about you, where I grew up, especially, you know, before I moved to St. Petersburg when I was really little, but I was actually born in a small town in the Ural Mountains. And in every apartment building, there are bars on the windows on the first floor mm -hmm. or ground floor. Is that, was that the same in Moscow? Yeah, lots of, yeah. And we did actually have them put in. Yes, I think after that happened, uh, we put bars on the windows, mm -hmm. which like, I mean, you feel safer, but at the same time, you feel kind of like, you know, you're in prison, you know, with these yeah, uh, bars on the windows. No matter how pretty Plus, those bars are, it's not nice to have them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you have to have a, a, a little key to be able to open the bars in case of a fire. So there's sort of that added element to it that mm -hmm. if, if there's a fire, you, you, have, you have to be able to get out. So, um, Okay. Yeah, I was very happy to leave the ground floor. Yeah. And what about the top floor? Why is that not desirable? Just because it's too high? Uh, well, just because of potential leaks. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, because uh, if Good there's point. a heavy rain, yeah, it might get leaked on. And uh, I think that's the main thing, actually. And my grandmother's on the top floor. And she has had some leaks and stuff. But, you know, those uh, Khrushchev... Um, 
buildings. They were designed for something like a maximum of 50 or 60 years. I can't remember exactly. And it's been way longer now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, hers yeah. are still there. Lots of the other buildings around her actually have been knocked down. And for as long as I can remember myself, at least 20 years, there's been talk of her building getting knocked down. And for a long time, it was every year. So this year, you know, this is the last year of this of this building, the last year that Granny's in this apartment. And then, you know, it came and went, it's and happening. the next year yeah. came along, and same thing happened, and now they're not even talking about it. So it's like, <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> it's going to be there until it just mm -hmm. crumbles into the ground. So do you know how long uh, your family had to be on the waiting list in order to get that apartment, their first apartment? Uh, actually, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I should ask. Yeah, that's a good question. I should ask my grandmother. I know it was about five years to get the apartment uh, in this new neighborhood um, in the mid 80s. But mm -hmm. I don't know how long they waited for for the first draft apartment. Five years. That's a good this question. is incredible. Anyway, like to think that you want to move someplace new, you want to make plans, you want to maybe, you know, start a family or expand your family. And you can't hope, you know, you, you can't make plans about no, anything no. regarding like real estate. And that is <laughs> oh, no plans. Yeah. And I, I think my grandparents had to get a divorce, actually, in order to be able to be eligible like a to join divorce? the queue. Because, yeah, because they needed to have um, like two separate families living in the same apartment in order to qualify uh, for uh, an apartment to buy an apartment you know again it's, mm -hmm. you know you're buying an apartment you're paying for it yeah you're not and, like uh, for free <laughs> yeah so yeah it was like in the so in the 40 square meter 43 square meter apartment it was my mom who was already like 16 18 you know so almost a grown-up um my grandparents and my great-grandmother and so four people for this tiny apartment and yet it was like whoa no 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 You've got, it's not enough. You know, you don't have enough people. Uh, you still have lots of room, so you're not eligible. And uh, so they got a divorce. And uh, my mom uh, was over 18. So so then she sort of counted as a separate family kind of. And, I, and, and was married to my dad. And so then finally it was like, okay, yes, you're allowed That's to crazy. join the queue. Uh, the five-year long wait li waiting list to be able to pay money to uh, buy an apartment. So, yeah. yeah. That, and uh, it's, I think it's still like real estate in Russia is still kind of mystifyingly um, backward. If, you know, <laughs> I mean, I know it's a, it's a big word, but it's like, it's still so strange. Like when we bought our apartment here, um, it was so strange bizarre the whole experience you know we had to pay cash it had to be done in cash so you do all the bank transfers and you know you get your big sports bag fill it up with cash <laughs> and uh you know we were in the middle of doing the transaction <laughs> when they did um a fire alarm drill and so everyone had to evacuate the building and <laughs> so my husband you know sandy um uh, was carrying this big bag a and it, we bag felt like cash. we were part of a Guy Ritchie movie. You know, when we all left the building, we're waiting outside. Um, and then they're like, okay, it's so fine now. You can come back in. And we went back in. But it, it was scary because, you know, you, you've you got all this money, um, millions of rubles in your bag and um, standing outside the building. The people you're buying from are right next to you. And we were buying from this guy, you know, it was like really big butch guy with like tattoos everywhere. And he was, um, he was quite strange. And, um, but it was all okay in the end. But I remember asking my um, realtor, so real estate agent saying, so why is it all cash? I mean, why couldn't it be done, you know, with just like regular transfers? He was like, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? <laughs> How else would you do it? It would be so unsafe to do it in any other way. And I was like, uh, okay, yeah. I mean, it hasn't been so long that we've been able to just freely purchase real estate in Russia, I guess. So it shouldn't be mm -hmm. too surprising that it is the way that it is. <laughs> yeah. And um, 
at least we don't have to wait. But tell me about your uh, your apartment story. So what actually, what was your house like or apartment like growing up in uh, Bacal, in in the town you were born? So I was born in a little town in the Euros, and we had a pretty, for Russian standards, we had a pretty nice living situation, which is um, what we would call in America a one-bedroom apartment. So yeah. it, it had a living room and it had a bedroom. But um, for a family of three, it was just my mom, my dad, and I. Uh, for a family of three, this was absolutely normal. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good because you get two separate spaces, basically, to sleep. So your parent, my parents slept on the couch. It was a fold-out couch in the living mm -hmm. room. And I, I was, yeah, I, I was a spoiled kid, I guess, an only child. I got the bedroom. <laughs> So oh, I got my own room. Nice. Yeah, that was great. And uh, so that was that was great. I really, like, in my little town where I was born, which the population was, like, less than 20,000 people. It's a really small town. But, like, the height, the height of wealth would be a two-bedroom apartment. So we were only, mm. like, one step behind <laughs> the mm, possible yeah. wealthiest, you know, people in town. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and norm like I knew lots of people who lived in just studio apartments, and what they would do is they would use like a big um, bookshelf, and in mm -hmm. in Russia, you know, it, it was it really it all started in the Soviet times, but they continued making those like giant bookshelves that basically they can really serve as a wall, like they are yeah. really huge. They have doors. You know, they yeah, and yeah, they yeah. work like as a complex. You can buy yeah. like three different ones, and they're all different. So what do they call um, stianka? <laughs> well, stianka, stianka. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you had to queue for it, and it was a real treasure. Yeah, to be able to buy one. My yes. parents had one. They were very proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Like, yeah, in the Soviet times, you would queue for them. I was born in early 90s, so I, my parents, not that they had to queue for stuff, it was, in, um, it was already all available, um, but it was more about just like how few things there were out there to yeah. buy, and um, we had a, you know, you and I had a chat last week, and I was saying, you know, I have an amazing mother who I think is watching it, but she doesn't speak English, <laughs> it's really cute, um, <laughs> but she was this amazing, um, she had this really Russian trait of character, she just knew how to be at the right place at the right time, and she knew yes. how to, like, so she would she chose for herself the best possible jobs in order to provide for her family so she as a career she chose like design she makes clothes so she studied mm -hmm. to be a tailor so she can do you know cut and so she can do anything uh because mm -hmm. you couldn't buy any clothes in the 90s there's just so it wasn't even about a queue there was no queue it was just like stores don't have anything <laughs> yeah um yeah so that was kind of the case and then so she would make clothes for people and people always wanted clothes so she always had lots of uh, clients and then the second thing um eventually my my dad went on to college when after i was already born and my mom got a second job at the grocery store which was like the best place to be <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely just like a shop at, yeah you know, just like a yeah, cashier was, it was the job, yes. <laughs> and then she brought like all the best all the best stuff we had like you know and by the best stuff i mean like a nice piece of ham. <laughs> That's like a yeah. nice thing to have, right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was and, it like yeah. real ham, or was it still like processed um, in the? In the, I, did it come in a tin or what? How? Oh no, not in a tin. It would be like proper ham, proper ham. In the nineties, you could already get that. We got that on special occasions, <laughs> uh -huh. and um, my mom used. Um, used that a lot in like salads 
because mm -hmm. as you know, and those of you who watch us and are familiar with my stories about our winter holidays, you know, we love mayonnaise salad. And mm -hmm. <laughs> there is this really, there are two pretty famous New Year's Eve salads, which is Olivier salad and crab salad. So the main protein for the Olivier salad is like bologna, basically. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, personally, I'm not a fan. I know some people nostalgically love it. Do you, do you love it? <laughs> um, well, I don't love it, but I used to as a kid. Oh, I adored <laughs> it. It was the white bread that is not, which I also can't eat right now. You know, it's horrible. But I used to love it. Yeah, some that is noy and, uh, and some butter. And then, yeah, this um, doctor's scan. Bologna. Bologna. Yeah. Yeah. We call it oh, doctor's, it doctor's sausage, which I guess yes. is implied that it's like really good for you and is really healthy. <laughs> I know. I know. I've, I've written about it in the book as well, actually, because I asked my grandmother about it. And she said that, yes, because it wasn't smoked or anything, it was sort of regarded as quite healthy. And, you know, they would give uh, kielbasa like salami or bologna to people when they defended their doctor's thesis. Oh. So uh, um, it was... <laughs> That's why we call it doctor's sausage. <laughs> so uh, my, yeah, my grandfather, when he got his, uh, no, what do you call it? It's uh, not PhD. Um, I'd say, yeah. They gave him a PhD. bunch of um, salami or doctor's bologna. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. so my mom would replace that with, Ham, nice ham. Uh, she uh -huh. she made her stuff. Yeah, so she in an Olivia salad, she would put ham instead of bologna. It was really good. That's what my husband and I do now as we make all these yeah. recipes on New Year's Eve. Yeah, and I love that. In yeah. crab salad, oh, is goodness. the thing is, you, you we just couldn't get crab um, as easily. Uh, and I'm even saying like Sorry. imitation crab, which is in Russia, we just call it crab, but it's it really imitation crab. We couldn't get it, so my mom just put ham in there instead of crab, and uh -huh. it was really good. Um, I sometimes uh -huh. really okay. crave crab salad, but with ham. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't know that there was no crab. I mean, as a kid, even as a young adult, I didn't know there was no crab in the crab stick. You know, the, the crab stick salad. Yeah, the imitation It was crab. only when yeah. I was writing this. I asked my grandmother about it, and she's like, yeah, you know, there's no, no crab there. I'm like, oh, okay. And I read the ingredient list. I was like, yeah, fair enough. There's some type of fish, some cheap fish, and then mm -hmm. there's just the coloring and some flavoring to sort of make it look like crab, so the, the, the red and white stripes. Yeah. What was your favorite dish as a child? Uh, well, I did enjoy... Mm -hmm. The crab sticks. I remember actually. I think we would freeze them, and I'd come home from school and get some from out from out of the freezer, and I unwrapped them. They were, you know, covered in that lit, tiny little um, um, foily thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved them. Just snacking on them was really nice. And uh, the bologna, um, grechka, the buckwheat, of course, you know, with milk and sugar, tvorog, mm -hmm. cottage cheese, or uh, with um, grated chocolate on top. My grandmother would do it this way, and it was really nice. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of fancy. <laughs> that does sound good. And uh, just some 90s junk food, you know, like we had those chocolate-filled, we call them padushchki, you know, like those little um, oh, pockets. Oh, it's like so cereal. You could eat them as cereal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they were so good. They were amazing, like with milk. And, you know, we never drank any water. Uh, it was either <laughs> milk or tea or a compote maybe. But I remember as an adult figuring out that, oh, you're supposed to drink plain water. <laughs> and uh, it was a revelation to me. We never did it. Did you? I did drink water. And my family, uh, and, you know, just for those of you who are watching not from Russia, we can't drink tap water in Russia. Um, and so having clear drinking water in your home is a whole ordeal. It's not as simple as it seems. Um, and as a kid, we didn't have filters or anything like Aww. that. But my family would just boil water and then put it in a, a glass jar to cool. 
And so we always yeah. had a jar of water um, in the kitchen. Um, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is the There worst. The worst possible thing is that when you're almost out of water in the jar, but nobody took care of boiling some more, <laughs> and you have to boil some more and then wait for it to cool in the jar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the worst thing. That, that's true. It's like you, you're so thirsty that you just like drink the super hot water, and <laughs> it, 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 it is the worst. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, uh, we had kombucha as well, uh, which Ooh, yeah. was tea, mushroom, and Russian, um, which was great. I, I had it every morning, I think, for a long time. And um, yeah, and I asked my mom once about water, and she said, "Yeah, it was not really, you know, wasn't a habitual thing to do to drink water." And I remember as a kid, actually, when like bottled water first appeared. It was such a luxury. Like if you went to someone's place and they had bottled water, it was like, wow, you know, like really wealthy family. It was um, sort of along the lines of uh, nice toilet paper. If you went to someone's <laughs> place, they had like what we now regard as normal toilet paper uh, was such a luxury because we just had that horrible rough stuff. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> not, it's so 2020 talking about toilet paper. <laughs> Yeah, but we are in 2021 already. So. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. What about your, um, so the recipes that you found, you know, that you used in your book, um, which of the recipes from, because the book was written in the Soviet times, which of the recipes stayed with you into your childhood already after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s? And which of the recipes kind of completely disappeared and were new for you to discover when you were working on your book? Yeah, so the book of tasty and healthy food, I just keep looking over there at it. Uh, I find a way of showing it to you because it's so big. Um, <laughs> To be honest, it's so big. There are over a thousand recipes in it. it. It's huge. And even, you know, a lot of the times they explain sort of methods, which is pretty cool, actually. They explain the method and then you, they give you all the variables of how you can prepare it. So it's got um, lots of recipes. I think probably over 1,500. Um, so obviously a lot of them I had never heard of. You know, there were some uh, ethnic dishes, you know, like from Azerbaijan, like I remember Bosbash oh, yeah. soup, which I'd never heard of. And um, it was quite nice, actually, it was lamb. But as you know, those dishes were um, Sovietized and they weren't authentic uh, dishes anymore, you know, like uh, harcho from Georgia, the spicy soup, and uh, plov from Uzbekistan, they weren't the same meals that they were originally, uh, you know, in the countries where they come from, or the republics, I should say. Um, So a lot of them were new to me. Some were dishes of so things that I knew, but they were different in the book. Like the crab stick salad. I actually don't remember exactly what the recipe called for, but I remember it was quite different to what my grandmother used to make. But things like that, you know, they depend, they vary so much from family to family. Everyone does their own version slightly, even though everyone has access to the same um, 10 ingredients, you know. <laughs> Still everyone uh, does their own thing. Um, But some things like vinaigrette, for instance, the vinaigrette salad, which I love. Um, the recipe is great, and I still use it, actually. Uh, I think it's really good. And um, I've started making pumpkin pancakes from the book, Ooh. which I'd never heard of. But, you know, it has recipes that you would never imagine. You'd never think of them as Soviet recipes. Like there's a, as a pikanka, a cottage cheese bake with figs, and carrots and apples and uh, like a, um, some other fruit, uh, which you think, is that like a Soviet thing? No, you know, it sounds so weird. And I would ask my grandma, she'd be like, I've never heard of it. So there are lots of, it's such a mix, this book. It's got a bit of everything, you know, it, it has really useful things. Uh, it has really elaborate, weird things that you would never make, that you would never have the ingredients for in the Soviet times. But it also has, um, like simple things that we're used to and all the and recipes from different regions. So it's just, it's so big. It's so kind of like, I don't know, um, 
I know how to describe it, like in the Soviet way, you know, if you're making it, it has to be big and proper and, uh, <laughs> and show how amazing uh, everything is. The country the, is wealthy, Soviet. yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. Speaking of the Pikanka, um, I'm so glad you mentioned it because um, just for you guys, for our followers, um, Anna created a special cooking video. So she already pre-recorded herself making this amazing dish, which um, for me personally um, is really connected with my childhood in the 90s because that's what we would often eat for breakfast in my daycare. Oh, there is the book. Okay, I, I want to... <laughs> yeah. No, no, I won't interrupt you. Keep, okay, sorry, so, I'll show yeah, you. The pikanka is this dish that um, at daycare we would eat in the morning and it's delicious it's made of cottage cheese and i don't know in my daycare they used um uh, raisins for it and it, it's baked and it's just mm -hmm. delicious it's like sweet but not too sweet it's still pr you know proper for breakfast and so anna created um a video of herself making the pikanka so that you can follow um this tutorial and make it for yourself you it, it's a really cool breakfast and at least for americans uh, out there it's definitely not like anything you guys eat for breakfast it is yeah, so different. Right. can you tell us you know what what that dish means to you did you have it as a child too uh, yeah, and you know, in, in my family, like my grandmother makes it not just with cottage cheese, but sort of as a casserole, she will um, bake whatever she has on hand, like some leftover potatoes, leftover pasta, rice, whatever she's got. She'll just whisk some egg into it, you know, uh, some breadcrumbs, flour, and bake it, and or um, cabbage as well. And she makes it all the time. It's like a very everyday kind of, uh, you know, use up the leftovers kind of dish. Mm -hmm. Which is great. I mean, it's just like ultimate comfort food, you know, yeah. that type of thing. And then the cottage cheese at Pikanka, I definitely had as a kid. And, uh, you know, when I taught my kids' cooking classes, like some, I would do them in uh, preschools as well. And, uh, so, you know, often I would come in and, like, the teachers would be like, we've got some of the left over, you know, would you like some? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. Oh, and, uh, yeah, it was uh, delicious. You know, some yummy crust and um, – I uh, actually, I sort of had a bit of a hard time making it myself. Um, I followed some recipes, you know, they called for the sour cream on top and they, I didn't really like it so much. So that's why I made a few different versions and I sort of come up with one that I like to make myself. And I went the non-traditional way of doing the, the brown sugar and cinnamon uh, topping, Ooh. which you, you don't normally, yeah. don't normally do that, but I thought it, it, it's nice. And, uh, for people who are not used to a lot of cottage cheese, that could be sort of a nice addition to it. Um, but yeah, definitely the water cottage cheese featured heavily in my childhood. <laughs> yeah, it's, ama it's an amazing dish that um, I certainly miss living in the U.S., but I'm blessed to be in California where it was a pretty big Russian population and there's a fair amount um, of Russian stores. Um, and I do, on, I, I do treat myself to some water, which is cottage cheese. They say sometimes yeah. like farmer style cottage cheese. It's just not as wet as the cottage cheese that Americans are used to. So a bit different. Uh huh. Do you make your own? Do you, can you get the milk, um, the type of milk to make your own? I've never tried. I and never looked into it. I might. I might do that now that you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, it's really not hard. Actually, I, I've never made it myself, but my grandmother makes it. And uh, yeah, it's not it's not hard, so uh, yeah, it's fun. So, do you want to see yes. the book of tasty and healthy book. food? So, this, this is the is... book that my book is based on. Um, you can see how thick it is. It's 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 pretty big, and um, it starts with uh, the words abundance, and describes basically how great the Soviet Union is, uh, how well everyone is doing, and then it's just full of uh, amazing illustrations. Um, amazing pictures actually soviet design was really impressive yeah um uh well there's like this kind of stuff can you see yeah yeah this is awesome and it's it's huge and uh, well this is quite famous actually this one is quite famous oh my gosh look at that feast <laughs> that looks amazing 
<laughs> I've read about people. Um, well, yeah, right. Uh, I, I've read, I've read the memoirs that people used to sort of use it as some sort of fantasy uh, land book, you know, like springboard into uh, just like dreaming of some a wild place far away where you could eat these things because you couldn't, you know, uh, <laughs> in the Soviet Union. Looking at this, all the fruit. You know, and the caviar and the, all the wines and stuff. It was like, it was not accessible to everyone. But that's the, uh, the amazing thing about this book. You know, it's it's a propaganda piece, and and an actually useful cookbook as well. So, oh, I know wow. I love this. Oh, that looks beautiful. <laughs> I love it. All yeah. the dairy products. Well, Anna, thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. And for those of you guys thank who you. Watched, watched us live, we have a special um, giveaway. So um, if you go into Eagle Travel's account, you will see the latest post, which is, has Anna's picture there and my picture. It's, it's, it's a post about our Insta Live. And uh, so for those of you who are watching today, we each want to give away something as a way to thank you. So um, Anna is um, going to give away one digital copy of her amazing Soviet diet cookbook. Um, and I'm going to give away a ticket to a virtual tour of mine. You can pick any tour of your choice. Um, and what do you need to do in order to get that? So just go into Eagle Travels account and within the next 15 minutes comment anything you want under the post you can just tell us whether you enjoyed our talk or you can post a question you know we didn't touch so many things today like we didn't talk about anna's life in georgia i only was able to ask her about a couple recipes i'm sure you guys are you know might have more questions about some other recipes in the book or growing up in russia in the 90s so uh, please feel free to <laughs> comment. You can post any questions. We will answer all of your questions regardless when you post them. But um, we, if you comment within the next 15 minutes, we will randomly randomly pick one winner to get a copy of Anna's school book and one winner to get um, a ticket uh, to one of my virtual tours. So please feel free to do that. Um, I want to thank you all uh, guys for joining us today. And is there anything you want to say <laughs> to those watching us today? Yeah, I just want to say thanks for uh, being interested in Russia and, uh, and for being curious. I love people who are curious about things. So, oh, someone says really enjoyed this. That's yes. Nice. Oh, that's so yeah. wonderful to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so and much. I look forward to uh, greeting people in Russia <laughs> once, yes. uh, as soon as we can. Totally. Absolutely. And Anna also has, um, she interviewed me for a piece um, that she's writing for Russian Life. And once it's out, I'm also going to share the link to that uh, with you guys. So you are absolutely welcome. To yes, I loved interviewing us. you and writing the piece. It was oh. so interesting. I loved <laughs> hearing about your story. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'll publish your cooking video today so everybody can oh, enjoy it too <laughs> awesome great thanks so much for having me on it was great right. to thank chat you to anna you. for coming here have a wonderful rest of your weekend and everybody else you too. too have, have a, a great sunday <laughs> all right you bye too. guys bye.